Good morning. This is Pastor Larson, and I am with you. The Lord is also with you. Most important, and as we consider something new and something that has been revealed to us, something very interesting. Many people have questions about heaven. What are yours? So I said, I am Pastor Ken Larson, the visitation pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church. And I always invite you to our worship services, 8.30 and 10.30. And you can come in person. Or if you're not able or illness keeps you away, you can visit us at trinitydelray.org slash live or tune in anytime by using YouTube and looking for the latest video by date. And this Bible study is on uh, Sundays at 930. I, I find it most easily by going to YouTube and putting Pastor Larson's Bible study in the search box. So we represent a little part of Trinity Lutheran Church. We've been around since, two, uh, since 1904. Yes, since 1904, Trinity Lutheran Church has preached the gospel not always at Swinton and Lake Ida, but in the last several decades, we have been here proclaiming the Lord's good news uh, to anyone who will come, including, oh, hundreds of children in our regular K through eight school. Oh, NK through eight. The wonders of heaven. The wonders of heaven. There are many, and I think it's true for everyone. You've wondered about heaven. You think about heaven once in a while. When do you think about heaven? When do you start musing about heaven usually? Class? Oh, oh. I thought that was rhetorical. Oh, okay. yeah, it was, and I changed it. Okay. Okay. When do you wonder about heaven? On what occasion? I think whenever I think whenever we have a, a loved one who passes, I think we think about it then, or if they're ill. Okay. I, I kind of agree with that. Uh, maybe when there's a serious illness. Yeah, I was going to say, even even oneself, as we get older and we start having uh, illnesses and ailments, um, yeah. we start thinking about, you know, if something should happen, um, where am I going <laughs> spiritually? <laughs> oh, soon. <laughs> yeah. Uh, teach me, Lord, to number my days that I might ap apply my heart unto wisdom. Psalm 91. I think even even uh, even younger, you know, uh, Jamie mentioned, you know, when we lose a lo loved one, I think even sometimes children, when they lose a pet, there is oh. often uh, the discussion if oh. there's any uh, spirituality in the family about whether or not the pet goes to heaven or have any service for the pet uh, and heaven might be discussed. Yeah, that's that's a very common question. What does the Bible tell us about heaven? Can you just kind of dig back into your Bible memory before we get started with our slides? That uh, what what have you remembered that the Bible tells you about heaven? It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful yeah. place with roads of emeralds and gold. Yeah. All right. Jesus said. My father's house has many mansions, and um, so it's big, it's vast. Uh -huh. uh, there'll be no more pain and suffering. Right. We'll be whole, we'll be whole and, and beautiful and wonderful again. Yes. Okay. Well, we're going to find out some more things. Anything else to add? Now let's keep going. Maybe you're asking questions like these. <laughs> and you've already mentioned 
Will there be animals, specifically my pets? Will there be my pets in heaven? Or I, I have kind of an answer to that, but I'm lacking a Bible verse right now other than Genesis chapter 2. Okay. Does everyone go to heaven? I think you have a pretty good Bible answer to that. Um, but it's one of the questions people do ask about heaven. And we have in the United States, at least in the part of the Western world, I suppose, a, a universalism. 40% of Americans believe that everyone's going there. That's a problem in making evangelism visits. We used to ask people those two diagnostic questions that Dr. Kennedy in Fort Lauderdale invented. Do you remember what the questions were? Mm -hmm. If you were to die tonight, would you be absolutely certain that you were going to heaven? Remember that? Did you ever learn the Kennedy plan for evangelism? No. Okay, well, that's new to you. And the second question was, well, if you were to die tonight and go to heaven and God would say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you tell him? Now, that's not literally ever going to happen. But the question is diagnostic, because depending on the answer, you might tell the person, I celebrate with you, or, you know, I think I have some good news for you. If they gave a works answer, then you you talk about the five-point outline, grace, man, God, Christ, faith. Never forget it. I'm not going to go over it now, but sometime, if you want, I could teach you that. It is gone, uh, it is not as uh, widely practiced as it was 20, 30 years ago. What about purgatory? I think you have heard about purgatory, and you wonder... What does that have to do with heaven and does purgatory even exist? Millions of people believe in something called purgatory. Well, what about it? Is heaven just an eternal choir practice? <laughs> yeah. Some people were afraid they might have to go up there and play harps and sing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The people in the choir um, probably think that would be pretty good. And they can sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation, and all the other hymns in the book, even the ones they haven't ever learned. Now, I suppose they have other hymns up there that we will be taught, but I haven't got a Bible verse for that. But some people want to know, what am I going to do there? And that's one of the questions that we hope to tackle eventually in coming weeks. Will I be like an angel? <laughs> have you ever... Have you ever heard people uh, talk about the transformation? When I go to heaven, I will be an angel. Have you ever heard people say that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Have you ever believed that? Um, yeah. Wondered. See, I said like an angel because yeah. I could be referring to the angel's holiness. Mm -hmm. But I could have worded it, will I be an angel? Or will we be able to fly like angels? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, there's a difference between the angels, created yeah. beings which do not normally have, uh, I'm going to say temporal bodies, but I'm not going to discuss it today. And then there's this blank where you can fill in your questions. And I intend, uh, if I don't, uh, please remind me, I intend to give you time to list all of your questions. In fact, I will be soliciting the questions that you have that I don't have on my list. I do have a list. <laughs> I intend to, to kind of have fun with this and yet be very serious about it. I am lighthearted about heaven. I'm looking forward to it. But right now, I've got some things to do. So here's how we answer your questions about heaven and anyone else's questions about heaven. And I think you know, you know me by now. 
how do I answer questions about heaven? <laughs> well, we're not going to guess. And listen to me, please, carefully. We're not going to speculate or just muse together about what we think about heaven or what we'd like to find in heaven. What I think about heaven, what you think about heaven, is, is not necessarily the truth. I have only one source for what I believe and what I teach and of which I am convicted. And that is the Bible, the words of Holy Scripture, which God has revealed, which the Holy Spirit has inspired. That is my only source and norm, as I said a few weeks ago. And I won't budge from that. If you start singing me a song that came from a recent motion picture, I will stop you and say, <laughs> please don't imagine. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lovely song, but if all you've got is your imagination, what, what has that got to do with truth? Unless it coincides with revealed truth in the scriptures. Now, I am I kind of sound hard-nosed about that, and, I, and I'm not going to apologize for that. In fact, I'm going to boast of it in a, in a humble way, of course. I have been convicted, and I hope you are too, that only the Lord can tell you about something of which you have no knowledge. Well, I am belaboring it. We won't read about others' experiences of heaven. Uh, several books have come out in the last couple of decades of people who have had so-called near-death, end quote, experiences. And they've come back to report what they have seen and heard. Mm -hmm. They may be true. I chose my words carefully. I cannot tell a person he didn't have an experience. I don't know if it's God's will to reveal. I know he revealed something to St. Paul of which it is not lawful for a man to speak. Uh, to most, to, to a large extent, St. Paul did not say a whole lot about his experience. Okay, I don't know what that is. Where... We're going to look into heaven through the Holy Scriptures. All right. The wonders of heaven. The first thing I want to say to you today is heaven has a lot more to do with life than death. Right? Amen. Okay. <laughs> and the reason I say this is this is what Jesus said. Judy, would you read? John 20, verse 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Yeah, life. So if Jesus isn't mentioning heaven, and this is John 20, 30 to 31, of course. The things that God revealed that Jesus did reveal about himself, his power, his divinity, by doing the signs that the Apostle John wrote about are for this purpose, so that we might believe. And since you and I believe in Christ, the Son of God, we have life in his name. So when we talk about heaven and life after death, we are talking about what we have been given that you may have. This is what is given to us. For as many as received him, that is Jesus, he gave power to become or to be the power, the authority. I hate to say ability because that's man-centered. He gave the exousia, that's the word for power, to become children of God. So that's a gift. So let's look into heaven through questions that people ask about heaven. And the first one we're going to look at is how do I get in? 
but I have six other questions that I intend to cover beside the ones that you bring up. Will I really meet God? An awesome experience, and the word awesome doesn't cover it. Who are the saints? And what's that got to do with heaven anyway? Will I know my loved ones? I think this is one of the most common questions yeah. about heaven. And we'll talk about that in uh, three, four, five weeks. Right? Will I know them? And I can think of a song. How about that? What is heaven like? The descriptions of heaven in the book of Revelation are not fanciful. They are real. They are images. They are the revelation, singular, that Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, gave to the apostle John. And he wrote them down because he was told to write them down. This is what heaven is like. But when we look at heaven through the eyes of John, through the images, the visions that he was given, ah, uh, as you mentioned, gold and emeralds. Ah, ah. I'm trying to to be wordless, which is difficult for me, but because it's so beautiful beyond any imagination that you or I will ever have this side of heaven. It's it's like what it is being with God. And I think we'll get a chance to talk about heaven, not so much as a place, but as an experience of being with God. And all that that is, <clears throat> what is heaven like? What are we going to do there? I think this is, I've asked this question all the time. What are we going to do there? Well, part of it is, I don't know. Praise the Lord. We're going to praise him. But since many people have difficulty spending even one hour a week praising God, they want to know, well, why would I want to do that forever? And I, you understand the difficulty that non-worshipping people have with praising him forever and ever and ever and ever and the evers never end. But if you are in love with God and what he has done to rescue from this present evil age, we are those who have an inheritance kept in heaven for you. First Peter chapter one. Huh. Uh, it won't be a chore. Someone is, was, is not going to have to drag you out of bed to get you to worship the Lord. <laughs> no alarm clocks in heaven. I don't know. We don't know if there's going to be day or night even, do we? It's all day. It's all day, which is the light. There, there is only sun. And when will all this take place? I am not going to study eschatology with you in, in detail. Uh, the, the study of the last things is long and detailed and filled with controversies of millennium. I just, uh, I get tired of it. Well, um, we'll look at Matthew uh, chapter, is it 24, 25? Um, which is where Jesus talks about when will all this take place? And that's the question the disciples ask him. Well, what are they asking about? Destruction of Jerusalem or heaven? And the answer is yes. <laughs> and he answers both questions and intermixes them. That's all I'm going to say today on that. But you see that that the, the, the wonders of heaven is, a, is maybe more detailed than you thought it was. All right. So let's talk about the first question. Question one, how do I get in? Now, 
it might be superfluous. It might be unnecessary for you and I to talk about this question, how do I get in? Because you know, you know. You want to tell me? You want to tell the people who are on this uh, later on? How do you get in? I have to believe in Jesus and that he died for us, for our sins, so that he could be clean right. and enter heaven. Right. Is that um, simple? I also I also believe in our baptism as um and that we, of course, believe in baptism as, as children, but we're already received into the kingdom of God when, uh, when we're baptized. In fact, we're received right. into the kingdom of God even before we're born um, as being chosen by God. He wants all of us to be in heaven to begin with. Right. Many questions come up when you discuss okay. that with people. Yes. Well... Let's go over the things that we already believe. How do I get in? Because somebody watching, listening, may struggle with this. And it's, it is it is wrong for us to assume that everyone knows the answer. So let's have a conversation first about death. This is an imagined conversation about death. And it's very short. All right. There are two people. Let's banish death said one. How? asked another. Uh, I don't know. Death is everywhere. It comes to everyone. But wouldn't it be great if death ended? Yeah, but when? When, when would that happen? At death. <laughs> For the believer, death ends at death. In fact, since Christ has already suffered death in our place, we will only suffer that physical death. But you understand there could be a conversation that went along these lines. Death ends at death. Well, I believe in life, don't you? I, I said this recently to a doctor. In fact, I try to say it the first meeting I have with any doctor. And I say this with all sincerity, with all gusto. I want to live. <laughs> I hope you can say it with that kind of conviction. No matter how sick you are, no matter how much you long for heaven, for the time being, God has given you and I this gift of life it's not eternal. It has an end. But for the, for the time that God gives us, I want to say to you that you say to yourself and to the mirror occasionally, I want to live. And do everything that God has given you, food and drink and the protections of medicine and all that entails and common sense, get a good night's rest if you can. For some of us, that is increasingly difficult as we age. So, I believe in life. Let life begin. Jesus brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. There are people who don't believe in immortality. Well, they're going to find out. It is Jesus and Jesus alone who brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, John 3, 16, and every other verse of the New Testament and the Old Testament as well, that tell us life begins with Jesus. Death is not the end, therefore. Death stops here on this earth. Now, I know some of you are going to bring up, well, Pastor, what about eternal death? Yeah, we're going to talk about that. But right now I'm talking about life here and life forever for believers who know that Jesus brought life and immortality to light. That means he revealed it through the gospel. 
Okay. So death is a doorway, isn't it? Correct. When you're um, preaching, you can say to the people who are not looking at the door, the front door, the church through which most of them entered, turn around and look at those doors. Those doors represent the way into heaven. They help you to think that death is just passing from death to life on the other side. Only in the case of death, we can't see through the door very well. Well, there's the door. How do I get in? And your answer is? Through faith, th through faith in Jesus Christ and through faith that he, um, he died for us and for our sins so that we might have life with him. So what's the door? You get in through the door. The faith? You go in through the door. Hold on. Oh. Where the is where is the door? No, who is the door? <laughs> I'm Jesus playing. Christ. Jesus did, Christ is the door. Did he say that? Uh, oh, I'm going to think in in Revelations. There's that Bible verse. Uh, he who knocks at the door. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone open, I will enter with him. Yes. So there's an earlier passage because you know this passage in John 10, verse 9. Evelyn, would you read it? I, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He is the shepherd. But here he is the door, and when we go in and out, I don't understand the out, and find pasture. You see, he's talking to people who are familiar with pasture lands and, and shepherds. And in another translation, he says, I am the gate. Now, sometimes gates are closed, but Jesus, being the gate to heaven, opens it to all believers. So we can talk about the gate. But before we do that, I want to show you a survey or two. I'm going to give you a chance to, uh, you know what people put a graphic on, this, on the TV screen and then they talk about it? Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, I wanted, to, I wanted to study that for maybe a minute or so and you took it away. <laughs> well, that's my beef. but. I want to give you a chance to look at this with me. Look on the right in the blue part. Six in 10 Americans say hell is a real place. But turns out most of them don't think they're going to go there. Um, Americans in general, not, not the divisions, but Americans in general, about two thirds believe heaven is a real place. Uh, and just stay with heaven now, just this first column, okay? Uh, black Protestants believe, 88% of them, that heaven's a real place. The Catholics, less so, only three quarters of the Catholics believe heaven is a real place. Evangelicals, which is a very wide description, 90% believe it's a real place. Mainline Protestants. Oh, this would be Baptists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, um, that group uh, that don't consider themselves evangelicals. I know many Baptists consider themselves evangelicals. But mainline Protestants from the denominations that you would recognize in the yellow pages, if you still have them, uh, 67 percent. That means a third of Protestants don't believe heaven's a real place. And you might quarrel with the word place, as I said earlier. Non-Christians. Oh, 
Only four out of 10 Christ, non-Christians believe heaven's in a, a real place. Um, hmm. But six out of 10 Americans say hell is a real place. Hmm. Now, this is a very disconcerting survey mm -hmm. concerning people who believe there are many ways to heaven. Almost half of Americans believe there are many ways. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me, said Jesus. Mm -hmm. There's only one. There's only one mediator okay. between God and man. <clears throat> if you have comments, jump in. I will stop. Only a third of black Protestants believe that. In other words, two-thirds say there's one way. Uh, two-thirds of... Catholics believe there's many ways. I don't think their catechism tells them that. Evangelicals tend to be Christ alone, but two out of 10 believe there are many ways to heaven. Of the mainline Protestants, the ones I mentioned earlier, over half of them believe there are many ways to heaven. I wonder who told them that. And non-Christians, about the same percentage, half believe there are many ways to heaven. Now, believing it doesn't make it so. <laughs> but because of the way the Western world has been taught to think by the secularization of our life, by the things that are said in the media, by stories that are told. Um, the truth is now relative. My truth is different from your truth. And uh, it's, it's only what I believe that counts. So that has contributed to this disconcerting uh, discovery that not everyone believes in Jesus Christ as the only way. You heard that in a sermon about three or four weeks ago. Pastor Vince covered that very well. Okay, American theological views. I know that surveys are subject to error, maybe as much as 10 points either way, but this gives you a general picture. Was this a relatively recent survey, Pastor? I, from, from the way the website was constructed, I would say it's less than a decade old, maybe newer than that. Okay. I actually don't think it's been changing much. Mm. You think it has? Uh, I think with the last few years it has, yes. With or, 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 just... or with the things happening in the political sphere? Uh Yes, and, and maybe we're just being made more aware of it. Uh, aware of what? More, more aware of people's views and feelings about things. Uh -huh. and, and they're expressing, they're expressing uh, well, not only their political values, but their spiritual values. Yeah, they're more open, huh? They're more open about saying, you know, no, I don't believe in Christ. I'm an atheist. They're coming right oh. out telling you. Uh, yeah. or, right. Right. Or, that type of thing. Do you have you are you familiar with the, the this this category of people called the nuns? N O N E S. No. If you put down what are you? Uh, an evangelical, a, a Catholic, a Protestant, a Lutheran, whatever, and then um, there at the bottom, there is none of these. And the sociologists who study this phenomenon, which is less than two decades old, the, the number of nuns, N-O-N-E-S, has been increasing rapidly in the last couple of decades. And that they aren't all atheists. No. But in fact, they won't all call themselves an atheist because uh, there are agnostics in that group as well. I don't know if there is a God or not, and I can't find out. So they are the nuns. 
they are not affiliated with any group of any religion. They are not Buddhist. They are not uh, any of the other world religions, Mohammedism. Okay. But yet, you're, but yet we're saying they still have, they believe in some sort of a, a supreme power? No, no. no. Or they don't uh, even believe in a supreme power, period. No, they, mm -hmm. they are totally nuns, uh, but they won't say I'm an atheist because oh, atheist okay. is one of the categories they're allowed to pick. You're only get, you only get to check one, and oh, okay. then they check none of these. And, it, you know, the self-revelation may be the, what you mentioned, Judy, is that these people are more willing to say that. I think that when I was a child and when you were a child, people weren't as willing to admit that they had no spiritual categories. They kind of kept that to themselves. Right? In fact, well, I, just, I, I don't I think it might be the part of the country you grew up in also. Oh, yes, yes. So upper Midwest is very religious. Mm -hmm. And the Middle South is very much of the Bible belt. Mm -hmm. But that's fading away. Oh, yes, the is. country has undergone a tremendous uh, tight, shift. tectonic shift mm -hmm. as people fall away from what they were taught or not taught as children. I, I, we can't discuss this in detail, but I just wanted to give you a picture of when we're talking about the wonders of heaven, there are so many, many people who say, I don't even care. I don't wonder about it. If it exists or not, I don't know. Are you going there? Don't know, don't care. Yeah. Empathetic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go on then. So I said, Time is slipping away from us. If I subtract 20 from that, I get 40. So that's where we are. There was a survey. Uh, this is much older. I'm sorry, I don't have a date. It's at least 10 or 12 years old from the source that I mm -hmm. copied it from. The survey asked, what do you think are your chances of getting into heaven? <laughs> Maybe you find that question rather unnecessary, but somebody asked that. One man in Michigan said about 50-50. <laughs> As I grow older, I think my chances are improving. <laughs> well, now, uh, uh, he was serious. Or, and, well, there might be something to it. <laughs> well, I would, my follow-up question, sir, is uh, uh, how is it that you think your chances are improving? I think as you get older, as you get older, you sometimes start thinking maybe those thoughts of your spirituality when you were younger start coming back because you feel you're getting closer to that time of uh, hopefully go, hopefully going to heaven. Evelyn, and uh, well, you think that's it's true? getting older. The older you get, the the closer you are to death and um, heaven or not. <laughs> So you start thinking about it, but what about this? I think my chances are improving. Why would that be so? Jamie, um, Jamie, do you have anything to say about that? Well, perhaps he's uh, he's being influenced uh, by family members or the world in general, and um, <coughs> he's uh, trying to change. maybe they're trying to change his mind. I, uh, you can share about your dad if you want to, but I'm not going to uh, say well, anything. My dad believes, my dad believes oh. that there is a uh, God and that there is Jesus, but um, he hasn't really expressed uh, his opinion as to whether he thinks he's going to heaven or not. Uh, I see. I try to talk to him sometimes about it, but he's not open to that conversation. Oh, okay. So he does admit that it was a good thing Jesus came into my life. Okay. So that I can, I, I show that by caring for him. Now, Judy, you and Jamie have been nurses for many years, decades, and uh, sometimes you were closer to a person approaching the moment of death than most of us are. Did you have any experiences that 
pointed to people having uh, late in life discovered there was something to Christ and heaven and well, I, I think uh, working in hospice, uh, it was not unusual sometimes. I think I've mentioned before, especially about families that there might have been uh, reconciliations between um, family members that, that uh, you know, where there have been disputes that have gone on for years and years. People are starting to realize that it's important to, to uh, ask for forgiveness and to uh, reconcile those things. Um, hopefully to make, I guess we feel we have to do those and, and forgive one another also in preparing ourselves for heaven. Things we should be doing all along, but have not done and are now suddenly kind of trying to uh, play catch up. Yeah, I think you're right. No. Well, I've, I've taken care of some people that were on hospice, but in a long-term care facility, not in a hospice facility. And and many times uh, at, towards the end, they're just so restless. And, uh, Did you say restless? Restless and in pain, and they seem not at peace. So many times I've just talked to them quietly and told them about Jesus and and sometimes, not always, but sometimes they seem to calm a little bit. Uh huh. So I, I hope that's true that they they heard me even though they could not say anything. Okay. I I, I, I can remember. Hear you say that. Go ahead, Judy. I said I can remember one little story, and this is also in the nursing home since Jamie and I also worked together in the same nursing home for quite some time, but. Uh, they would have offer services, uh, you know, uh, Protestant services or Catholic services, or often there were the Jewish services. And uh, I think one little lady was Jewish once, and she was sitting in one of the Protestant services when her daughter came, and her daughter was quite upset that someone had taken her to that service, but then later discovered that that her mother, you know, wanted to go. And when she asked her mother why she went, she says, well, she says, you know, I think I need to cover all my bases. <laughs> <laughs> and so she was, she, she wasn't sure, but she was going to make sure that she, uh, she covered all her bases before the end. Oh, dear. That, that always reminds me of the man who took out an insurance policy from every one of the companies because he didn't know which ones would actually uh, be there at the end when he uh, needed what to give the money to his family that, that is not a true story no, no. yeah <laughs> no. cover all his her bases um <laughs> i uh why halt ye between uh is it left and right uh that's old testament i can't find the quote well leave that for a go now there's a man in his late 20s he said my odds are 85 percent but he's only in his late 20s rather naive i would say and he put his odds at uh 85 percent he said he didn't think the final exam would be that tough <laughs> i don't know which one is uh more humorous hmm. Cover bases. Uh, that that would be. I was going to say there could be some logic in that thinking. Well, if we've only lived, you know, in our twenties and we aren't now in our eighties, we haven't we haven't done that many bad things to uh, to offend uh, God before we uh, pass on. Yeah, so maybe, that's maybe my, my maybe my chances are still better. That's my racquetball partner of many years ago. I've stopped talking about him. He was in his 80s and was sure that he had never committed a sin that would cause eternal death. Well, final exam. Well, it turns out the final exam is very tough. The Bible says you shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Several passages in the Old Testament. 
The Bible says nothing impure will ever enter heaven. Sinners are not admitted. So that's a pretty tough exam. And no one measures up to that except the Son of God, who is holy and always born sinless, never sinned, and always did and said the will of his Father in heaven. Okay, so he can go. In fact, he returned to heaven. Luke 24 and Acts chapter 1. But nothing impure will ever enter heaven. Sinners not admitted. Well, where does that leave us when we face the final exam, which is not a literal thing? So I want you to answer uh, this question. If perfection is required, that is no sin, but holy in thought, word, and deed, who can go to heaven? None of us. None of us None based of us. on that. Yeah. Right. You know the other answer, but don't be... Uh, don't leap to that yet, please. If perfection is required, no one's going. None is righteous, no, not one. Uh, Romans chapter 3, quoting uh, one of the Psalms, I forgot to, uh, to look up which one that is. So answer this question, do I have to die to go to heaven? That has a little bit of a different answer. What say you? Yes. You have to die to go to heaven? Yes. Yes. Evelyn, uh -huh. You all say that. But you know the exception to that. I'm not talking about Elijah. I'm talking about the par the the possibility that Jesus Christ will come while I'm still alive. Okay. Oh. Then we I was, uh, I guess, I was also thinking of the power of uh, believing and coming to Jesus and forgiveness uh, that people obtain. I know it's not the heaven we refer to as eternal, but life can become more like heaven on earth. I will disagree with that. You're going to disagree, okay. Because our, our life on earth is filled with sin, our sin, other sin, the results of sin, That's true. And the illnesses and the pains and the, I don't have to go on. You understand no. that this is not. Now there's other people in the world who will say, I don't think there's a hell. I have suffered hell on earth. That doesn't even begin to describe the real hell. You've suffered a lot and I listen, but this yeah. is not hell. So maybe life has become more bearable would be a better word. All right. Do I have to die to go to heaven is my question. And, the and that's yes. Is, yeah. Those of us which remain, St. Paul is talking about Christ's return, will not precede those who have died in Christ. But they will rise, and then we which remain will meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. What a wonderful promise that is. Boom. In so the, an the answer to that question is the second coming. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. If, it, if it happens while we are still alive, and many people say to me, I hope he comes while I'm still alive, because they won't have to die. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you many Boy. How many times have I told you, dying is not the problem. It's what leads to the death. Yes. You have been with people, uh, yeah. even if you're not a nurse, you've been with people who suffered a very pleasant death. It's almost like they didn't die, except now they're not breathing and their heart is not beating, but the body is laying there and the family gathers around. I don't want to get too maudlin here because yeah. we have to get out the Kleenex. But I don't have to die to go to heaven. But for most people, it's true. And I know why you answered that. This is not a quiz. We're not grading you. <laughs> well, I'm going to make some points, and I have five of them. And I think we have time today to make the first point. If I subtract 40, uh, I mean 20, 
I don't have much time. Well, we were not made for death. God did not want anyone to die. Although in his perfect knowledge, he knew that death would enter. And when it happened in Genesis 2, God was not. Uh, Genesis 3. Genesis 3. Uh, when, when death entered the world, God was not surprised. So the question, like a catechism question, isn't it? How did death enter in? Through sin. Evelyn, uh, let's see, Jamie hasn't read, huh? Take her mute off. Oh, Jamie, is your mute on? Yeah, Jamie, you're you're muted there, and uh, I can only ask you to unmute. I can't unmute you. Or are Thank you me. having mic problems? Yeah. No, I'm un am I unmuted now? You're good. Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, you can hear me now. Okay, yeah. Genesis 2, 17. Of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall now eat. For in the day that you eat it, eat of it, you shall surely die. Please go on. Genesis 3, 6. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. That's how death came into the world. The saddest chapter of the whole Bible is Genesis 3. All the other sadnesses come as a result of what Adam and Eve did in, and it's recorded in Genesis 3. The point that we're making is we're not made for death. God did not want anyone to die, but this is still true. Back to Judy, please. Uh, Romans 5, 12. Sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men, because all sinned. So Paul is pointing to Genesis 3. So we inherit death. It is not something that we can explain. It's one of the Bible truths that we accept by faith based on what the Holy Spirit inspired here. Paul knows that death was as a result of this one man. The good news comes after that in the same chapter of Romans is that life came into the world through one man, Jesus Christ. Jesus brought life. Pardon? Yeah, Jesus brought us life. Yes. So we were not made for death. I say what the Bible says, that God went into the recreation business. Not recreation. Recreation business. You are recreated, St. Paul says in one of his letters. So he sent his son in the likeness of human flesh. That son of his shared in our humanity. He participated in what we are here on earth, except without sin. He was human in all results, in, in all uh, results. He was human in every way. Right? He got hungry, he got thirsty, he walked, he got dirty, he needed his feet washed. Everything about Jesus was the same as us, except without sin. Well, why did Jesus share in our humanity? Why? Evelyn, would you read Hebrews 2? 2, 14 to 15. So that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Why Jesus shared in our humanity so that he could die. Yeah. And by his death, freed us from the power of the devil. Free, free us from the fear of death. 
free us from slavery to that fear. God doesn't want you to be afraid. So I'm trying to find out uh, where this section ends. It's okay if we go. Uh, no, it's not okay. Well, this is good. So next time, if the Lord wills and he doesn't come first, there's some sad news coming. Okay. I hope that what we are covering is useful to your faith, not just of your knowledge, but of your faith and confidence that when your last hour comes, you will know with certainty. And if you still have voice, witness to those around you that you know where you're going. I have been at the bedside of many who have died and I've seen how comforting it is mm -hmm. to the family when the one dying says, I know, I know I will be with Jesus okay. because he died for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. And whatever, however they say it, this is not the time to make little corrections, but to hear that wonderful confession. I pray this for you and for those you love. Gracious Father, attend our thoughts of death and life. Attend us as we think about what we might be, a, be experiencing one day, our passage through the door, which is the door of your son, which he opened to us through his death and resurrection. Keep that promise before our eyes and secure in our hearts. Watch over us in all of our difficulties and especially when we think about past sins, remind us that they will not shut us out of heaven, but that this son of yours, Jesus, died also for those. So we express our confidence to you and to each other in this prayer, which we offer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And...